All right, well, our next speaker is here, um, and I want to be sensitive to her time. Um, she, she's a very busy woman, but it's a great pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague here at the White House uh, who serves as our Senior Policy Director for Immigration, Felicia Escobar. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it seems like you are having a good conversation and, um, and uh, networking with, with your colleagues and with some of my colleagues in the administration. Uh, again, uh, my name is Felicia Escobar. I work in the Domestic Policy Council here at the White House. We're the office within the White House that is, um, that is specifically charged with um, um, interagency coordination of, uh, on the issue of immigration and uh, working with our agency partners, people outside of government, in collaboration with the Office of Public Engagement and others uh, to advance the president's policy agenda on immigration. You know, the president is very focused on um, the need for legislative reform, um, and that's something that we've been focused on since, uh, since he got here into office, something I've, I've been working on with him since August of 2009. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult battle. Uh, it's, it's a difficult issue, particularly in, in tough economic times. Um, oftentimes, as, as you all know, as we all know, um, people uh, like to uh, scapegoat immigrants in, in tough economic times. So that's something that we've been grappling with uh, on a daily basis as we think about the need for immigration reform, the fact that we know, and you all know, that immigrants are an incredible um, source of, 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 uh, of energy and excitement. They, they build um, our economic engine. They're the, they're the reason why our, our government and our, and our country has been such a success globally. Um, they're entrepreneurial. They had to take uh, the initiative to leave their home countries and come all the way to a new country may, where they may not know the language, they don't know the culture, uh, they don't know the systems, and they make that, that entrepreneurial step. Um, and once they get here, they thrive and they help us, they help our country thrive. So that's something the president believes in very strong, strongly. And as we think about immigration reform and the need for immigration reform, there's obviously national security implications, um, but there's also, from our perspective, economic uh, implications as well as, as moral implications for, um, uh, for the need for reform. So it's something we continue to be very focused on. Uh, we have a, have a difficult time um, in terms of building the, the bipartisan support we need in Congress. Um, I was here uh, in 2006 and 2007 uh, working in the Senate uh, for Ken Salazar from Colorado on immigration reform. We got very close to having um, a comprehensive bill uh, enacted in 06 and 07, but we didn't get there. Uh, we, had, um, we had a very good uh, group of people that were from both sides of the aisle and who were willing to work together uh, to get this, get, get this done because they knew that it was an important uh, imperative for our country. We need to get to that point again. Uh, and that's why, you know, working with, with you all, working with leaders from all over the country in different sectors uh, of, the, of, of our country, whether it's business leaders, faith leaders, labor leaders, civil rights and immigrant rights leaders, uh, state and local elected officials, we really need to, to build the case for reform again and really make sure that people understand that this is something we can and should get done. So we continue to be focused on the legislative front. Um, but there's a lot we can do, there's a lot we can't do, but there's a lot we can do to improve the way the system works. Uh, and so as we continue to look for legislative reform, we're also very focused on um, administratively reforming the way the, the way the current immigration system works. Uh, we all acknowledge that we're dealing with a broken system um, of laws that need to be fixed, but there are things we can do. So um, uh, on the enforcement front, uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple years uh, working with the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Labor, and others that are involved in enforcement um, that impacts immigrants uh, to make sure that it's done in the most effective and efficient way possible. So for, from D, for DHS, that means uh, making sure that uh, they have clear priorities that they've set and that people understand. Um, when it comes to uh, who they're going to be, who they're going to make decisions to remove, and who they're not going to make decisions to remove, um, and for, for people like the for agencies like the Department of Labor, that means making sure that we have clear standards um, and are doing uh, our due diligence to make sure that uh, workers are protected in the labor. Uh, in, in the workforce um, and, in, and, in, and, in, um, and in employment settings, regardless of their immigration background. So there are things like that that we're doing to, to improve the way enforcement is done. Uh, there's also a lot we can do as it relates to the, to the processing of, of the millions of, uh, of uh, hundreds of thousands of applications that come through uh, the immigration system every year. So whether it's you know, getting a tourist visa or it's um, getting your, um, your family-based green card application processed efficiently 
or it's getting a, um, or getting a um, an employment based uh, green card or coming through the country coming to the country temporarily on an on a non immigrant temporary worker program. Those are all things that we're working to fix. Um, one thing that we uh, are also working a lot to do as we think about the about, about the immigration system is is figuring out um, how we can uh, make sure that immigrant entrepreneurs who want to come to our country are able to come here um, through the through the existing systems. There's work that needs to be done to create uh, visa programs and visa policies uh, that would actually create a more streamlined process for immigrant entrepreneurs to come to our country. And, um, but we are doing doing work right now at USCIS through the uh, entrepreneurs and residents. Um, initiative to streamline the way the current system works for immigrant entrepreneurs. Um, on the family-based immigration side of things, um, we're doing a lot to make sure that people have uh, the tools that they need to actually succeed in the naturalization process. So we've supported and funded an immigrant integration uh, initiative. It provides funding to nonprofits around the country that are engaged in that work, engaged in helping people prepare for the citizenship test, prepare for um, to meet their English language requirements. Uh, we're also working to ensure that fees that people get charged when they're going through the naturalization process are um, uh, are are not going up. Um, the the economy changes and 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 inflation happens. And USCIS is a fee based agency, so uh, in many respects they they have to over as the years go on and the years progress they have to raise their fees. But there are things that we think they can do in terms of improving efficiency uh, within the within the agency to keep fees, uh, particularly the naturalization fee, constant. So in this administration we have not. Not raised the naturalization fee uh, since we got here. We have a strong commitment to keeping that fee constant, particularly in this economic climate where we know that people really want to become citizens, but that that economic impediment, uh, the fee uh, impediment, is something that is uh, is challenging, right, for lots of people. Uh, we're also working to, we've, we've established a, a consistent um, way for people to get waivers uh, for fees. It's not something that uh, we, uh, you know, USCIS has a, a particular fund that they have set aside for people that want to come through the process and that, um, that, that don't, aren't able to economically uh, pay the fees that they, uh, the fees to move their application through. Uh, they can apply for a waiver. There's a clear form that they can use. There's clear standards that uh, USCIS adjudicators use to make that determination. And um, over the last couple of years, there have been quite a few um, fee waivers uh, processed and, and, and approved. Um, and just one more thing on the, on the naturalization front uh, and on the USCIS front in general, I would say the USCIS is doing a really good job from our perspective, and they can always do more, um, to engage immigrant communities and communities that are impacted by the immigration system. Um, they have an, a, a huge office of public engagement that um, has engaged in, um, in conversations about all kinds of immigration visa programs. Start, they've started to this year, uh, over, over the last couple years, I'm sorry, to, um, to work towards a, engaging people in their native language, so Spanish, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese, Korean, trying to talk to people uh, in the language that is the most appropriate for them to get the information that they need about the system. Uh, and then the one other thing is you know, USCIS revamped their entire website when we first got here, and one important feature that they added was, um, was uh, creating a way for people to get uh, updates about their applications via text or email. Um, I'm sure many of you have know people or maybe personally experienced your, it yourself through legacy INS and other and other um, and and the and the, the first uh, USCIS the first iteration of USCIS uh, times where people would submit their application and a year would go by they they didn't know what happened with their application they didn't know what, where it was in the process and then they find out a year later that they have to actually restart the process of naturalization they've lost that time perhaps their their check has been cashed um, but they're still having to re restart the process that's something that um, this new way for checking where your application is uh, in, in where it is in the in the pipeline is something that is is designed to impact. We want to make sure that people, um, when they pay a fee, their application gets processed and they actually know where it is in the process throughout the system and throughout the time that they're going through the adjudication. So that's something we're we're proud of. There's, like I said, there's always uh, room to do more, um, but uh, we believe we've made some important steps uh, to to make the system work better. So you know, I'm happy to answer a few questions uh, about about uh, what we're working on. Um, there is, I could talk forever about this, this issue, uh, so, you know, I don't want to over, overload you, but happy to take questions, um, a couple questions, and then, um, you know, hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. You know, I was really, I was reading through uh, the helpful information that Gadam prepared for me, and, um, you know, I just think that your mission is really a, a great uh, admission. It's, it's something that, um, and your values and, and that you believe in are something that, that matter to me as I think about
about my work on, um, on the issue of immigration, I noticed here that it said uh, that in your vision you believe in the, in the promise of America and the talent of Korean Americans that make that promise reality. I really think that that's what the immigration system is about. So, um, you know, one of us to work together as much as we can collaboratively because I really think we share the same vision. So, so yeah, so I, I would open it up for a couple questions if people have any. Hi, my name is Yun Jung Yang, and I'm with the Korean American Women's Chamber of Commerce. Um, on the issue of um, comprehensive immigration reform, mm -hmm. I understand that it is a very hot topic. Um, there are different views on both sides. I understand that criminal issues and the workplace uh, enforcement issues, all those are issues that I think there's opposite, opposing sides. Mm -hmm. But on the issue of family immigration, mm -hmm. I think as a country, we are one united. You know, on this issue, is USA is our country is based on family unity. Mm -hmm. We want to bring families together. But in the area of family immigration, the quota system requires makes families be separated too long. I understand that U.S. Um, spouses of U.S. citizen or children under age 21, they can come in quickly. But when you have a green card holder who just married his beautiful wife in Korea, you're, work, you're looking at about a three to five year wait. You have a US citizen, sister or brother, petitioning for their US sister back in Korea. Mm -hmm. That's a 20 year wait. Right. You are separating families. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm asking the administration to look into this one area of immigration. Let's bring families together. Let's unite families together. Because if the families are together, they help each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, family members who have, you know, who have other family members here, the new immigrants come to the United States and they can adjust better. Mm -hmm. It's just a transition period is one. So if you could take that back to the administration. Sure. And say, well, and, and I, can, I can say a little bit about that. So the, the changes that you are, are talking about to the changes to the, the family based, the per country caps, the annual caps that are uh, overall, that are, the number of green cards we can issue every year, um, is something that is, is actually a change we have to make to, in law, um, unfortunately. Um, so that's something that we support. Uh, we support the idea of changing the way the per country caps work. Uh, there's legislation that we've endorsed that's moving through Congress right now. We would include it in comprehensive immigration reform, but if it can move right now, we would like it to. Uh, and so what this legislation would do is it would eliminate the per country caps that exist right now. So right now, there's a certain number of visas issued every year for family and for employment. Um, but on top of that, there's only 7% only of those total numbers can be used for one particular country. Um, and so what we would do is we would lift the caps on the employment-based uh, visa system. Um, that impacts a lot of folks from, from China, from India uh, in particular. Uh, on the family-based side, uh, we know that there's problems with, with the caps. Um, and we would, we would adjust the cap, so instead of being a, a 7% cap, we would, we would move it up to a 15% cap per country. So that's something that we've supported, we've, we've endorsed. It's actually something that's garnered bipartisan support in, in the Congress, so a, a bill passed out of, out of the House of Representatives pretty much unanimously. There was a few folks that voted against it. Now, it's now pending in, in, in the Senate, and there are negotiations going on right now, ongoing negotiations to get that legislation through. Uh, you know, the issue with immigration uh, reform and legislative reform is that because nothing significant has moved, really, in the last 15 years, <laughs> a lot of people want, if, if, their thing, if that thing is going to move, the people that have been working for 15 years on something else want their thing to move, right? So that's what's happening right now with, this, with the Senate bill, or with this bill that's pending on the per country caps. Um, some people in the Senate, um, bo on both sides of the aisle, frankly, um, want their piece of stuff included before they let that bill go. There are a lot of people working um, to, to advance that bill and to help people um, adjust, address concerns um, so that the legislation can move forward. And we can share more information with you about that. We welcome you all uh, helping us in, in educating people on the Hill about, about the fact that this is something that really should be it should be a no-brainer, and, and we should really get through. Um, and I think they need to hear from as many people as possible o over in the Senate uh, in order for this to get done. So I can take one more question. 
Are we done? Okay. So Adam, Adam, tell me we're done. But uh, he has my he has my contact information, and I'm I'm happy to you know continue the dialogue with with any and all of you. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is my great privilege to welcome both David Hinson and Malcolm Lee from the Department of Commerce. Uh, they are great partners with the work we do at the U.S. Small Business Administration, and so we'll just do a brief introduction uh, of the two of them and uh, then allow them to do their remarks in terms of uh, their areas of priority. So Malcolm Lee is currently the counselor to the secretary and director of the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning at the U.S. Department of Commerce. It ultimately means he works on many of the priorities of the administration and has a direct ear of Secretary Bryson. His areas of focus include increasing exports and investment and strengthening U.S. manufacturing and innovation. Uh, Malcolm has previous experience in the private sector, has worked abroad in China, and so um, works on many of the administration's policies that, quote, focus on our shift um, and pivot to Asia. David Hinson is the national director for the Minority Business Development Agency at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, he oversees an extensive staff and team of uh, people across the country that are working on behalf of minority-owned small businesses. He has uh, assisted many minority-owned businesses in obtaining nearly $7 billion in contracts and capital. This is very important because actually the U.S. government is the number one customer of goods and services in the world, so making sure that minorities are an important participant in that um, is essential to creating new jobs for their, our communities. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Malcolm to do some uh, remarks in terms of his areas of priority. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, and I want to thank, first thank all of you for being here. Uh, you know, as, as Chris said this morning, participation really matters. And uh, your being here uh, as Korean leaders really makes a big difference. I, I remember you know, when I started my career after college, there was, a, there was a session going on, and I went to work in the U.S. Senate. And I could count the number of you know, Asian Pacific Americans out, outside of the offices from Hawaii on pretty much one or two hands uh, in the Senate. Um, and now I go back uh, and I see Asian Americans you know, throughout public service. So your voice needs to be heard and we, we appreciate it because we learn from you when you speak up. Um, and it's great to see some old friends. You know, speaking of participation, I want to call out Mark Kim for his, his, his great leadership and, and stepping up and, and being a, a, a public official. Um, um, and as part, of, as part of the President's economic team, I want to take just a step back and take a step back and, and, and talk about what, what uh, President Obama and his administration is fighting for. And you know, we're fighting for the basic American promise that you know, with education and hard work, uh, and you, will, you, can, you can raise your family, you can send your kid to, kids to college, you can save a bit for retirement. And, and, that's, and that's the story of the Asian Pacific American community and the Korean American community community. It's very much you know, my family's story. My father, you know, my father uh, was born in the U.S. In his family's small business, they had a laundry. He, he earned a penny per shirt he ironed. You know, he, he served in the, uh, in the South Pacific uh, and uh, went to college on the GI Bill and, and ended up working for a you know, pharmaceutical uh, company uh, for his career. My mother was a, a social worker raised in New York Chinatown. Her father was a civic leader. Um, and she spent her career as a, as a uh, uh, you know, counseling um, uh, uh, troubled youth and, and learning disabled kids in the Philadelphia you know, public and faith-based schools. So I think there's a dream that we are all fighting to, to, to build upon and, and maintain. And where we are right now is where, you know, as an administration and as a country, we're fighting our way back from the worst, worst recession um, uh, since the Great Depression. Uh, Eight million jobs we're lost. That, that's our inheritance. Uh, and um, uh, you know, this economy, as, as, as Chris said, has, has created private sector jobs for 27 straight months. Um, a total of 4.3 million uh, jobs have been added back. And the President knows what it takes to put folks back to work. Um, and you heard Chris Liu talk about the to-do list. I won't, I won't go into it here. 
uh, you know, we need cooperation, we need your support, we need uh, uh, action by Congress as well. Um, as Ellen said, I lead the Secretary of Commerce's policy team. Um, our job at Commerce is to help American companies grow and create jobs. Um, the Department of Commerce, uh, I'll just take a moment on that, is essentially a holding company to, to uh, boost jobs. Uh, we focus on trade. We have the International Trade Administration. Uh, we focus on national security. We, have the, uh, we administer the export control laws along with state and DOD. Um, we focus on economic development. I'll leave that to, to uh, my colleague David, uh, who is, who is uh, leading MBDA. Innovation, um, we have the National Institute of Standards, everything from standards to cybersecurity. Uh, the National Telecommunications Information Agency, working on you know, 21st century infrastructure of broadband and, and um, spectrum and other, other things. Uh, the Patent and Trademark Office, ensuring that uh, we are at the cutting edge of innovation. And science, um, we have uh, uh, NOAA, the, which handles weather, oceans, fish, um, and we have uh, do economic statistics. We have uh, the Economic Statistics Agency, which uh, uh, administers the census, uh, as well as the Economic Statistics Agency, which announces you know, our economic numbers. Now, we support the President's agenda to create an America built to last. Uh, and we are answering in our best way we can the, the President's call to out-educate, out-compete, out-innovate, and out-sell our competitors. Um, you know, Secretary Bryson, uh, ha as a former CEO, has said, you know, we need to focus. And he's selected three priorities for us. One is manufacturing, uh, the second is exports, and the third is investment. You know, and his, his goal, as he stated, is for America to make it here and sell it everywhere. So I've been asked to focus a bit on trade, and I'll just uh, touch some highlights. Again, the President has set forth a very ambitious goal to double U.S. exports globally uh, by 2015. And why do we do that? Because 95 percent of consumers live outside the United States, and there is a very, there's a rising middle class uh, throughout the world. You know, our core belief is that American businesses, uh, given a level playing field, can compete and win anywhere. And that's, that's our job. The, the National Export Initiative has three major uh, tenets. One is to open foreign markets. Two is to address unfair trade practices. And third is to promote U.S. exports. And I can talk more in detail in Q&A on any of those. Um, Let's go to the results, because that's what we should be measured on. Um, you know, for the first time in U.S. history, annual U.S. exports of goods and services cro uh, crossed $2 trillion in 2011. This is important because in that year, exports supported almost 10 million U.S. jobs, over a, a million more than in 2009. Exports are up 36% since 2009, you know, clearly we face some headwinds with global growth slowing, but the administration is working very hard with key governments abroad and leaders abroad uh, on economic stability and, we're, and restoring uh, growth both here at home and abroad. And we are ramping up our efforts on export promotion, even in this challenging climate. The President has, you've heard about the pivot to Asia. You know, we do have increasing focus on Asia, whether it's from a security standpoint, across the board, an economic standpoint. Uh, it's because it's the fastest growing and one of the most dynamic economies, which all of you know. Uh, you know we've had a very, very um, active dialogue uh, with China through the Strategic and Economic Dialogue and the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade. The Korea trade agreement is absolutely historic. It is, it is, uh, it is cutting edge and precedent setting. And we're taking it even further with a, a new Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, um, which we're active negotiating, high standard, again, even more cutting edge. Hopefully, it'll be a model for trade agreements uh, uh, with other countries and potentially even the, the WTO uh, eventually. Um, you know, this creates an incredible opportunity for all Americans, but I think particularly the Korea, free, free, uh, Korea Trade Agreement uh, for Korean Americans. And just a, just a few words on, on, on Chorus. Um, you know, Korea is our third largest trading partner. Uh, uh, we are Korea's third largest trading partner, and Korea is our seventh largest trading partner. The agreement will eliminate tariffs 
on over 95% of consumer industrial tariffs within five years. The tariff reductions alone are expected to boost U.S. exports by 10 to 12 billion annually, supporting more than 70,000 jobs here in the U.S. and make our companies more competitive in the Korean market. And who benefits from this? Yes, large companies benefit from this, but uh, here's some, some interesting facts. You know, uh, SMEs are the backbone of our U.S. economy, as you know, and the primary source of jobs for Americans. These businesses grow faster when they export. With respect to Chorus, you know, in, 19, in 2009, there were 20,000 companies that, U.S. companies that exported Korea. Of this, over 89% were small and medium-sized enterprises. And these SMEs supported 8.4 billion in merchandise exports to Korea, re representing almost a third of U.S. exports in that year. So great opportunities for business. Um, finally, beyond exports, yeah, again, I said that we're focused on manufacturing, exports, and investment. Investment, President Obama has identified it as a major priority. There was a time, not very long ago, when America was the default country to invest in. Right now, there's a lot of places in the world to invest. There are a lot of places uh, that are growing. Um, the Commerce Department and the President uh, fully understand that we have to compete for investment. Um, and we've have a, the President announced an initiative, Select USA, that's housed in the Commerce Department that is to, going to assist both um, foreign companies that are investing in the U.S., working with local leaders, local businesses, local universities, um, uh, and uh, help U.S. companies expand in the United States. So again, this is a, this is a very high priority. We're going to compete, and, uh, and we're going to win. Great. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Thanks, David. Thanks, uh, thanks, Malcolm. And given the fact that Malcolm borrowed every one of my talking points, <laughs> <laughs> very little to say to you. Thank you very much. I'm going back to work. No, I appreciate you being here. And certainly, uh, thanks to Ellen Kim. And you know, we've had a great time working together at SBA. SBA is a uh, is a, a sister agency to us uh, as well. Esther Lee, who is a former Department of Commerce colleague and friend, and I've, it's just been a joy. Uh, participating with you and, and last night for those of you who did not have a chance to make the reception there was a wonderful reception uh, I was angling to get my picture taken by the celebrity photographer uh, <laughs> and I feel like if I can get him to take my picture and then get him to photoshop it in with the picture of Lady Gaga I think I'll be ready to go. Uh, we'll, we we'll, work, we'll work on that yeah, we'll, yeah. please work on that uh, what I'm going to do is talk about the minority business development agency and now I'm going to spend some time talking about the Korean American business community so we can try to get, uh, help you understand what we do uh, as an agency. We are a job creating agency. Um, we are the only agency in the federal government tasked to promote the growth and global competitiveness of minority owned and operated firms, which is inclusive of Korean American companies. Uh, we manage a national network of business development, business centers. Uh, interestingly enough that in the cities with the largest populations of Korean American businesses, we have centers in each one of those cities. Uh, and I'll tell you why I put a pin there and I'll tell you why that's important to us. Uh, but when you think about the Korean American com business community, you're talking about a community that essentially is composed of 200,000 companies that generate $78.3 billion of gross receipts every year and employs 423,000 people. The average minority-owned business in America generates about $178,000 of gross revenue annually. The average Korean-American business generates about $406,000 annually. So the Korean-American business is about 2.3 times as large as the average minority-owned business in America. When you look at it compared to general businesses, it's only slightly smaller than the average business in America. The average business generates about $500,000 of revenue. So let's put this in perspective. Uh, when you think about the fact that the uh, South Korean economy, 15th largest economy in the world, 1.1 trillion in, in GDP, um, nice size economy, a lot of good potential, a lot of good growth. The Korean American business community, um, with that $78 billion, is about 7-8% of the South Korean community, but if you took that community outside of the United States and called it a nation, it would be the 63rd richest nation on the face of the earth with an economy bigger than Ecuador, 
Croatia, wow. and the Dominican Republic. I say that to say that this is a community that has extraordinary economic power, extraordinary economic power. And when you combine the Korean American community with the broader Asian American community, you're talking about a community that generates half of the uh, total economic output of the nation's minority business community. That's $500 billion a year and accounts for 50% of all employees uh, generated by minority owned and operated businesses. This is a huge sector and thus it's a huge opportunity. What we want to do uh, and what we're here to do is to help these companies grow. Uh, what we do is provide access to contracts and capital uh, and access to new markets and in that respect Last year, uh, we assisted minority-owned and operated firms uh, in gaining access to $4 billion of contracts and capital. But here's the problem. The problem is uh, only about $139 million of that went to the Asian American community, uh, and a subset of that $139 million went to the Korean American business community, uh, which is why I'm here, uh, and which is why I need your help uh, to figure out what we need to do to engage this community much more closely. Now, that $139 million is a 92% increase over the prior year, so we've been making headway in our outreach efforts, far from sufficient relative to uh, the period of the Obama administration. And I'm going to update your numbers. We've actually helped minority-owned firms gain access uh, to $11 billion, not $7, $11 billion of contracts and capital, which is a 101% increase over the prior administration, but within the Asian American community, and again, the Korean American community is a subset, um, we have assisted these firms in, in, in gaining $255 million of 11 billion. That's problematic, and, and I think we all would agree with that. Now, that's a 13% increase over the prior administration, um, but when you look at the economic power and the economic velocity uh, of the Korean American business community, we have to do a lot more. Uh, only 37% of Korean American owned businesses actually create jobs, actually have employees. So we have to get those numbers up and following on Malcolm's point, this community has a huge potential to create jobs, both domestically and also through export uh, opportunities. Minority owned firms in general have the best export capabilities of any sector in the U.S. economy. Um, and this won't surprise you when you look at the fact that uh, uh, when you look at the s statistics that came out of the U.S. Census, minority-owned firms are twice as likely to export, three times as likely to be pure exporters, but there's one that really always catches me. Minority business managers, Korean-American business managers, are more than six times as likely to transact business in a language other than English than non-minority-owned business managers. Uh, and so what we have to do is figure out how we can work together to actually take this community, this business community, uh, that's generating, you know, a solid, you know, seven. Keep in mind that the Korean American business community are representing three percent of the firm, minority-owned firms represent seven percent of the gross receipts. This community, in every category, whether you look at, you know, average family income, eighty-nine thousand dollars, you know, one of the highest per capita incomes of any sector of the economy. Unemployment rate four percent, one of the lowest unemployment rates for any sector in the U.S. economy. We have to find ways to work together, and that's why we're here. We're here to help these companies grow. So let me spend a second before we go into Q&A talking about the economic opportunities that exist in partnership with MBDA. Um, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, we have 40 business centers in the top 10 cities with uh, largest Korean American populations, Los Angeles, New York, you know, Houston, Chicago, and so on like that. We have centers in each one of those cities, so we need your assistance in helping the Korean American business community engage us, so that's one opportunity. Another opportunity, uh, for those of you who do federal contracting, how many people do federal contracting? Anyone here? We have a few. We just launched this year under the leadership of President Obama, the first federal procurement center that's designed to specifically provide services to minority-owned Korean American own businesses to help them gain the skills, access, and information to better compete for and win federal contracts. That business center uh, is here in Washington, D.C. It's staffed, and so we want you to engage us if you are doing government contracting so we can help you uh, gain better access to contract to, to government contracts. Uh, every year we do a conference called MedWeek, 
September 24th to 27th, which is a very good opportunity to come meet procurement people from the government, meet uh, uh, senior executives from Fortune 500 corporations, and we want to help you get into their domestic and global supply chains, and that's a new focus uh, of the agency. Finally, and I'm going to follow up on Malcolm's comments, I cannot underscore enough the economic opportunity that exists with Chorus, the economic opportunity that exists with taking the goods and services that are created in the Korean American business community and exporting them, not just to Korea, to other parts of the world. So we are refashioning ourselves, that is MBDA, to be a part of the export apparatus uh, of the federal government. Uh, it's a new and exciting and innovative uh, uh, effort that we're undertaking, and I will tell you that since we started this effort a year ago, we've done uh, 60 uh, export transactions as an agency that total somewhere around $300 million. Uh, so we're on our way. It's a little bit slow, but we're on our way. So what I need you to do is to engage our agency. I'm going to give you my contact information. Again, my name is David Henson, H-I-N-S-O-N. My phone number is 202. 482. I know you think this is crazy, but I'm going to do this. This is how committed I am. 202-482-2332. You can email me at dhinson at mbda.gov. If you have a company and you want to grow your company, partner with us. And not just us, but the Department of Commerce, because we really do work as one commerce. Uh, if you have a friend that has a company that needs assistance, strategic support, technical support in growing the business, Please contact us, contact me, and we'll refer you to a center. Um, if you don't know which way you want to go with business, but you think you can employ someone, definitely contact us. We'll help you find a person to employ, and we'll help encourage you to employ someone. And as you talk to your, uh, to your colleagues, uh, some of whom uh, employ one or two people, some of whom employ no people, encourage them to take the step to think through the process of changing their business model to pick up one additional employee. Because as those of you who have employees, you know that it's one thing to work for yourself. And before I came into government, I actually ran a company. I managed money for wealthy individuals and families. Uh, so I know a little bit about wealth creation. Um, it's one thing to manage a company and do it yourself and be a, 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 a sole proprietorship. It's a very different business model when you say, I'm going to bring someone on. I'm going to think through how do I make payroll. I'm going to think through benefits. I'm going to think through retirement plans. But what those thoughts force you to do is to think about how you're going to grow your top line. And you begin to think about new ways of growing your business, new markets. And then you begin to think about strategic partners. And when you get to that point, you should be thinking about the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Minority Business Development Agency. So I'll stop there. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. Great. We're going to make sure everyone on the live stream got your phone number as well. Uh -huh. So thanks for that. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I think we actually only have time for one question. Um, so I'm hoping it's a great one. Sure. Go ahead. He's coming. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sure. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Samantha Chong. Uh, I represent uh, Washington General Trade and uh, federal government consulting firm. In the last you know, 13 years that I have been servicing both Korean and American business firms from uh, uh, mainland Korea and here in the United States who are pursuing federal government opportunities. And I have one issue that I want to address, including um, Ellen and also two suggestions, and I'll be brief. Uh, first um, issue is that this has been ongoing and challenging across the uh, federal government agencies. Um, it's about the unbundling the federal government contracts. I think, first of all, before I address the issue, I think on the globe, U.S. federal government uh, for the federal acquisition regulation is the best system because I experienced how Korean government, as they put their efforts forward, uh, in terms of bringing small businesses and uh, uh, isolate businesses in terms of uh, the government uh, supplying and government uh, contracts. Uh, I know a lot of Korean government representatives come to visit general service administrations and SBAs trying to model our small business advocacy programs. So I just wanted to uh, uh, express my gratitude uh, in terms of the uh, small business advocacy, you know, minority women-owned businesses, 
As a matter of fact, um, you know, SBA has done a great job. Uh, now the women-owned small business is one of the, the, the six uh, federal certifications, so that is uh, encouraging news to the, uh, the women-owned business sectors. The first, the, uh, the issue is the unbundling contract. I don't know if I have to explain furthermore, but especially in the, uh, the challenging uh, technology solution areas, for example, uh, green buildings, sustainability, uh, all of that that advance the technology areas of industry, it is a challenge to a lot of federal government agency program officers and the contracting officers. If you sit in the cubicle all day long, unless you go outside of your realm of business day to day and learn the new technology, what's going on. And whenever I read federal government solicitations, it's totally so bundled. I know it takes extra work to unbundle the contracts in specialty technology areas. But I don't know how across the border, the agency, uh, policy advisors, and actual contracting officers who write the you know, specifications, well, to me, specification is not specific enough. And uh, you know, when I meet with a lot of small business people with the great solutions, technology ideas, when you actually see unbundled uh, technical parts of the uh, solicitation. It's easier for small businesses who can go ahead and work with the large businesses and uh, contribute the small business uh, participation goals there. So um, it's a challenging issue, but I think we need to find a way to address the, uh, the unbundling contract issues. Uh, second one is your yeah, suggestion. Um, from my experiences, I have met with a lot of Korean and American uh, small businesses have great technology ideas and such. And some of the, uh, the Korean business firms that I have experience with from Korea, they, have, they may have great technology and solutions, but they have a tendency of not understanding the biggest the customer on the globe, the US federal government, and that they just want to kind of put their hands down and hope somebody here in the US to deliver their, their products and services and promote their businesses. Um, I would like to suggest the idea of promoting joint venture system. Any foreign business uh, uh, firms following Kia, Hyundai, their uh, business models, when they come here, first, that they must have transferred technology, create the jobs. So it's no longer somebody comes here and, and sell products and wash your hands, go back to Korea, say, adios. Great. It, it's got to be a, a joint venture system and that there's got to be some kind of, besides the tax benefits, some type of incentives that we can uh, provide. So I'm going to just, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut you off. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's OK. So um, I don't know if you, if somebody has maybe a 30-second response, yeah, but otherwise, I, I, we're I, running I have your, I have your emails. I'll follow <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, you do have my email. Sorry. No, quickly, I mean, on the unbundling thing, absolutely right. Get it. And not to shorten the response, but it's actually something we're looking into and have been over the last year. It's an issue of how to do it. Uh, in light of the additional costs that unbundling uh, creates, but I think you're absolutely right, and it's something that the president, uh, you know, has has touched upon. Uh, Valerie Jarrett, who uh, runs the interagency task force on small and minority business contracting, has touched upon it. So it's something we're looking at. Great. And just one one final thing is that you know, with respect to the Korea trade agreement, you know, it's a hundred billion dollar market. The trade agreement creates a more level playing for U.S. producers. Incredible provisions on e-commerce cross border services, so your clients uh, should take a look at whether they can sell to the Korean government. So I'm going to ask everyone to join me in thanking David and Malcolm for their time. Hi, I'm Esther Lee. I'm one of the founders and uh, currently serve as vice chair of the Council of Korean Americans. Welcome to this briefing. Um, it's an honor to be here as a former uh, administration member to hear from some of my old 
uh, colleagues. And uh, today I have the distinct honor of moderating a discussion on an issue that we all care about, which is foreign policy and U.S.-Korea relations. And for this discussion, we have two very distinguished speakers. Um, Harold Hongjo Ko needs no introduction. I think everybody knows who he is. Um, but he currently serves as legal advisor um, at the uh, Department of State. He's a well-known expert on public and private international law. Uh, prior to joining the administration, he served as dean of, of Yale Law School uh, for five years, and I think before, and you taught there for about 16 years. Um, he's a graduate. Um, he also served in 25 two- 25 years. 25 years, oh, I did my math wrong. <laughs> Um, he served uh, in two administrations prior to that um, as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor under Clinton, and also in the Justice Department under Reagan. So I'd love to know how he's been able to do both Democrat and Republican. Um, he graduated from Harvard, Oxford, and Harvard Law School. He has 11 honorary degrees, which I'm sure makes your Korean parents very happy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and we're very, very happy to have you here. And to his uh, left, we have with us Sid um, Seiler, who's the director for Korea at the National Security Staff at the White House. Um, he joined this, uh, the Nas NSS about a year ago from the senior, um, before that he was uh, Deputy National Intelligence Manager for North Korea at the Directorate for National Intelligence. Uh, and I'm most interested in your uh, experience in the National Clandestine Service at the CIA, which probably means you were like James Bond, right? Well, no, <laughs> uh, He spent 30 years uh, in, uh, in and around Korean issues. And in fact, he's fluent in Kore Korean. He's uh, spent 12 years living in Korea. He's married to a Korean American. So all of you should feel encouraged to ask him questions no. in Korean. <laughs> He has a master's in Korean studies from Yonsei and has a master in theology from Chesapeake Reform Theological Seminary. Little known fact, he's actually served as the English minister at a Korean American church. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us. I'll start with Harold. Um, other than um, Joseph Hahn and Lincoln Park, you are the closest thing our community has to a rock star. <laughs> and I know you've played a critical role on, on very important recent events like the um, Chinese civil rights um, activist Chen Guangcheng. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your role? What exactly does a legal advisor do at the State Department? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Esther, for hosting this briefing. Um, secondly, uh, you mentioned my honorary degrees and why my parents are proud. It's pr they're proud because they didn't have to pay tuition. <laughs> um, and uh, also, uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a Sun Seng Nim. Um, uh, I have these uh, periods where I spend time in government, uh, but I will always return to the role of, of teacher. This was something that both of my parents told me. In fact, I, my first job in the government was a lawyer in the Reagan administration, and when I told my late father that I was going to be a lawyer, he said, well, you know, that's the, the second most dishonorable profession in Korea. <laughs> and I said, what's the most dishonorable? And he said, actor. <laughs> and then when I became a lawyer at the Justice Department, he said, you're a lawyer for an actor? <laughs> <laughs> so as you can tell, uh, like my parents, my father and mother were always satisfied with uh, everything we did. Um, <laughs> But it, what I think is exciting to be here in this gathering of Korean American leaders at the White House is, is just how remarkable uh, that is. I mean, think about it for a second, uh, that uh, this group of leaders would be here talking about Korean affairs. That seems about as likely as that the President of the United States would be an African American, uh, or that three of the last four Secretaries of State uh, would be women. Uh, that the ambassador to Korea is a Korean-American, Sung Kim, uh, or that uh, people like myself or my brother Howard Kyungjuko, who is the Assistant Secretary of Health at Health and Human Services, could be serving the United States um, in these important roles. Um, so this shows how far we've come. I know that many of the uh, more senior members of this audience remember when you had to explain to people where Korea was, uh, <laughs> what's the difference between Korea, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Japan, China, uh, where you had to explain what the difference is between North and South Korea. 
Um, and now, remarkably, my, my parents, uh, my mother came from Seoul, my father is from Jeju-do, and I'm surprised by how many people I meet who know and have visited Jeju-do. <laughs> right, and I hope you all do as well. <laughs> um, uh, this is all a, uh, the important uh, point that I hope will override what both Sid uh, and I will say, uh, which is, um, this is a mature relationship between the United States and Korea. We have moved from uh, an uh, alliance forged in blood to an alliance forged in uh, common interests, uh, to opposing common threats, to now uh, a global partnership based on common values, which I think is extraordinarily important for all of us. Uh, back in the old days, um, uh, Korean-American parents would not encourage their children to become foreign policy experts or, or political people. Uh, they wanted us to be scientists. Why? Because they thought we would win the Nobel Prize, right? So, of course, the first Korean to win the Nobel Prize, Kim Dae-jung, won for politics and <laughs> human rights and, and peace, uh, which showed, again, uh, how um, correct our parents were. Now, um, my job as legal advisor, I'm coming up on the third year. I am uh, Hillary Clinton's lawyer, uh, and my client also includes uh, President Obama. Um, uh, I am uh, the head of an international law firm of uh, 200 plus lawyers, about 350 people. Uh, we have uh, 24 functional offices that cover the range of US foreign policy diplomatic issues, political, military, economic and business, uh, intelligence, uh, as well as regional offices, which include uh, an East Asia and Pacific office. Um, I think we play four basic roles. Um, I am a counselor to the secretary, general counsel. Uh, I am a uh, um, litigator in the sense that I represent the United States uh, in any international tribunal in which we are uh, sued, uh, which includes, for example, the uh, International Court of Justice, uh, the uh, criminal tribunals, the um, UN fora in which uh, our legal arguments are um, uh, questioned, uh, as well as uh, domestic litigation involving international issues. Uh, third, we're a negotiator uh, on uh, treaties and other kinds of international arrangements. Uh, and sometimes that involves being an action officer, uh, as in the recent case of Cheng Kuang Cheng, which uh, occurred when I was in Beijing. Uh, and we worked to secure his uh, entry to the US Embassy and his eventual uh, move to New York, where I visited him a few days ago at uh, NYU Law School with his family. Uh, and finally, um, I think we are a kind of conscience for the US government with regard to compliance with international law and human rights. Um, we have a close tie to the academic community. Uh, I think most fundamentally, uh, the legal advisor um, is supposed to tell the secretary both uh, what legally she can do uh, and what, as a matter of our global standards, uh, we should not do uh, because it will affect our legitimacy in international uh, uh, environments. Uh, and I think that um, one of the accomplishments of this administration has been to work with partners like Korea on global standards. Uh, there is a range of uh, issues on which we cooperate. Um, Sid is our expert on national security, uh, on economic policy, uh, environmental issues, human rights, democracy building. Uh, in each of those areas, uh, we look to uh, our colleagues from uh, the Republic of Korea to uh, have a commitment to the same global standards. Uh, in other words, it's not American values being forced on Asia or vice versa. Uh, it's a common commitment uh, that gr grew out of a uh, set of shared experiences and common values. Um, I think that this partnership is extraordinarily important. I cannot tell you how exciting it is to me that the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, is. Uh, from Korea that the president of the International Criminal Court, uh, President Song Sang-hyun, uh, is a professor of Seoul National University, that a Korean-American, Kim Jim-young, is the um, head of the World Bank, or will be the head of the World Bank, uh, and that 
in U.S. foreign policy, um, increasingly there are Koreans uh, participating at every level, Koreans and Korean Americans. I mentioned Sung Kim, but I came from this morning's senior meeting uh, at the um, uh, State Department, and there were four Korean or Korean Americans uh, sitting in different positions uh, at the table. And this would have been unthinkable uh, years ago. There's also a Japanese American. We allowed him to sit with us as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we suggested that other individuals sit on the other side of the table, which they did do. So. Great. Thank you so much. So, um, we've all been watching North Korea and its actions since Kim Jong-un took over last uh, December, particularly with the missile test, as well as the recent threats to bomb South Korean media outlets. Um, can you talk about sort of our strategy and approach in dealing with the new regime, and what's the future of, of six-party talks? Uh, thank you, Esther. And I'd like to open with, a, a, again, a, a word of appreciation for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. <clears throat> Thirty years ago, I made my, my first uh, trip to the Republic of Korea as a young soldier in the military in 1982 as the, the memories of 1979, 1980, the tumultuous uh, events of those years domestically, uh, the, the, the political evolution, the uh, economic evolution of the Republic of Korea that accelerated as in the 1980s turned into the 1990s and into the 2000s. And uh, you know, I like to tell my friends, I knew Korea before Hallyu was cool. Uh, and, and it's been a, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a lifelong experience of watching uh, political and economic and, 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 and indeed security theories uh, played out on, on a peninsula that remains quite fascinating. The one uh, regrettable constant, however, in many ways, is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which, uh, because of the, the way the system has been uh, established, the way it has created a hermetical seal that seems to make it impervious to the the uh, pressures, the flows of history, democratization, information flows, economic changes. So, so much so that in, in the early days of what we see with the uh, Kim Jong-un leadership is something that is, is marked, I think, in one word, consistency. And it's not a surprising consistency. We would not expect uh, the, the government of, of, of North Korea, the, the regime, the, the world view or the stra strategic goals of that regime to change overnight. It's, it's really, in, in many ways, uh, somewhat a, 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 the, the nature of, of, I guess, the 24-7 news cycle and, and expectations to, to ask the question, what has changed in North Korea? And indeed, it's, it's way too early to tell. Uh, but that speaks to the heart of our policy toward, toward North Korea, which has been consistent since the president first took office. And he, he uh, established early on a, a willingness uh, to engage with those countries who are willing to unclench their fist and reach out, uh, articulating that we have no hostile intent, no inherent hostile intent towards the DPRK, that we are committed to peace and we are committed to an improvement of relations. But one that was fundamentally uh, built upon a, a, a seriousness of purpose on North Korea's part uh, toward the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, toward renouncing provocations as a standard tool of their coercive diplomacy. And early on, uh, North Korea challenged uh, that approach with their rollout of a, a Taepodong missile, which they launched uh, in 2009, followed by a nuclear test. And of course, we know the two regrettable incidents of 2010 with the sinking of the Chunan uh, and, and then the shelling of Yunpyeongdo. Uh, in all these cases, uh, center to our North Korea policy has been the strong reliance with the Republic of Korea. A strong alliance, as Harold noted, that has really matured into a lie. It's a, it's a forward-oriented, future-oriented, uh, co-equal partnership uh, around which uh, you know concerns or fears or vulnerabilities to North Korea. This incessant concern about you know Tongmi Bongnam that if somehow we engage the United States with DPRK, the South would be shut off putting all those things aside and looking forward to the future, the partnership that we've been able to establish uh, with Seoul over the past three years has really helped us to change the calculus with North Korea so that they no longer can use these provocations as a tool of coercion. 
that they no longer can execute a missile launch and expect us to come suing for dialogue, that they, you know, a nuclear test is not going to get us running around to figure out what next we can put on the table to induce into dialogue. So I think, you know, a firm consistency and openness to dialogue, but only dialogue that is that we have some degree of confidence that North Korea is serious about and will live up to its commitments. And, uh, you know, sharpening the choices to the to young leadership in Pyongyang. There are two futures available, and the president made this clear in a very historic uh, presentation at Hanguk Wigotakyo, at uh, uh, Hanguk uh, University of Foreign Studies, where he made it clear to the Pyongyang people, there's a future out there that's, that, that is uh, brighter, involves uh, the same economic, political, and human rights benefits that the Republic of Korea has, and it's up to the leadership to make a choice. Great. If I could just say Please. something. Uh, you know, I visited North Korea twice when I was a student. Like many of you, I went to the demilitarized zone, walked around the table in Panmunjom. But in December of 2000, uh, I went to Pyongyang with Secretary Albright uh, for four or five days. And we had extensive meetings with uh, Kim Jong-il uh, and a group of other individuals. Um, and it was a remarkable experience, as you can imagine. Um, at one point, for example, the motorcade went ahead to uh, a, um, a rally, uh, and I was still at the guest house where we were staying, so I actually hailed a spare car, one of uh, Kim Jong-il's um, burgundy Mercedes, mm -hmm. and was driven to the, to the uh, stadium, and I you know, came in the back and sat with some uh, North Korean people, uh, watching the rally, and then I sort of made my way over to where the American delegation was. And um, th there are a couple of things that should be clear. You know, one is that um, uh, I think the North Korean people see the difference between the life of the South uh, and the life they're leading. Um, uh, somebody said to me once, you know, we're talking about Koreans here. Uh, they are very highly motivated individuals. <laughs> and to see uh, uh, at the uh, human to human level how dispirited people were, they don't have electricity, the government cannot provide for basic nutritional needs or human rights. Um, and they are fully aware, uh, I think, although through whatever mechanisms of information, um, that there is a different possibility ahead. And when we left, Seoul, uh, Pyongyang to fly to Seoul, which as you know is only an hour away. Uh, we took off from Pyongyang in pitch dark because they were conserving electricity. There's a tiny run of lights. Uh, and then only 10 minutes later, we could see Seoul from the air, which as you know, if you've come into um, uh, the airport, uh, w was just uh, brilliantly lit. And I thought nothing could be a better uh, illustration of the difference. You know, these are the same people. The only difference is one side is ruled by uh, uh, dictatorship, the other side is ruled by democracy. One side is impoverished and cannot feed itself, the other side is enormously successful and energetic. And we landed then in Seoul, which as you know is you know, sort of a uh, you know, turbulent, exciting, uh, metropolis, um, vibrant and full of life, when we had just left a completely uh, dead uh, feeling place where nobody was on the street, there was no nightlife. And um, in some way, although it was very sad, uh, I had the very strong impression that this, this cannot go on forever. It really can't. I mean, I just, uh, um, the, the choice is too stark uh, and, the, and the advantages of, of uh, uh, the kind of participation and alliance that we have with uh, the Republic of Korea are just too obvious. Uh, so I, I think that um, our parents have always said, when will this change and when will this change? The answer is we don't know. But I have complete confidence that it will happen soon. Great. So Harold, um, I think China is now the largest trading partner for many Asian countries. I know Malcolm, you spoke about this, uh, including Korea. Can you talk more broadly about this administration's policies for for Asia specific, uh, broadly and sort of strategies specific, uh, in your thoughts around the U.S.-Korea relations and, and, and sort of the future of that partnership? 
Well, Sid, Sid could obviously say a lot more about the pivot to Asia and the strategic relationship. Um, I just came from the strategic and economic dialogue between China and the United States, where four cabinet members, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Geithner, uh, Trade Representative Kirk, and uh, Commerce Secretary Bryson, plus some 250 senior officials, uh, attended for an incredibly broad range of discussion from Afghanistan to trade to human rights to um, uh, civil society cooperation, et cetera. Um, the Chen uh, incident occurred while we were there, and I think was, again, the, an illustration that um, the days of a zero-sum relationship, if they ever existed, are over. Um, that the relationship is strong enough now to support a serious dialogue on some of the most difficult questions. Uh, um, and I think um, the pivotal role of the Republic of Korea in this relationship, uh, it is the go-to partner on virtually every discussion about um, regional cooperation, uh, the various Asian fora, um, uh, uh, ways in which uh, trade, commerce uh, can uh, deepen the ties, people-to-people -people relationships and the like. I'll ask Sid to say more. No, I, I agree. That's a very good way to capture the significance of, of the event that you were participating in, in particular, as it occurred during the, the strategic and economic dialogue. As for the Republic of Korea, you know, we, we early on in the administration concluded a, a joint vision statement uh, during uh, President Lee myung Bok's 2009 visit, which has really provided the framework for the relationship. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, it provided a framework in which uh, President Lee, in the pursuit of his Global Korea Initiative, began to take a more outward uh, engagement in diplomacy. I remember a friend of mine, uh, a professor uh, in Korea who was uh, involved in, in some of the foreign policy uh, discussions, the goal for, the, for Seoul was to move its foreign policy orientation outside of this exclusively all foreign policies inter-Korean standoff to looking outward to the world, getting involved, hosting the G20, hosting the Nuclear Security Summit, sending a, 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 a provincial uh, reconstruction team to Afghanistan. Uh, and indeed, in, in, in every aspect of our, of our policy, economic, security, uh, diplomatic, in Asia, uh, the Republic of Korea is center and right there, and we have a, an equal partnership. The, re, the personal relationship between the presidents translates into uh, incredible cooperation between our State Department, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, the mill-to-mill -mill relationship has a long history, so you're exactly right. These, the, uh, at the, the centerpiece, the linchpin, the cornerstone, we, we change the name depending on the set of talking points of, of our policy in the Asia-Pacific region is the relationship with the Republic of Korea. So I just have one last qu quick question. I encourage all of you to, to uh, think of some questions for our distinguished uh, speakers. So quickly, Harold, um, you've had an incredibly accomplished career and you're a hero in our community. What's next for you? You've also been mentioned many times as a potential candidate for Supreme Court justice. Uh, but I, I'd be curious to hear, you know, do you plan to be in the next uh, second administration, if there is one, any thoughts on you can share with us? Well, my immediate plan is I'd like to go on vacation. <laughs> 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 oh, it's true. I mean, you know, these are tough jobs, and um, it really takes a lot of work. And uh, um, you know, the, the the pay is not the greatest. Uh, and uh, you're in public service. Um, yeah, we're in public service, and that and seven dollars buys you. Uh, <laughs> A sandwich at Kosi next door. So, um, but I, I can't tell you, this is my uh, um, 32nd year since I graduated from law school, but it's also the 10th year that I've been in the U.S. government. Um, and the transformation, I think, is huge. There was a time when, when I started where, you know, I was the only Asian in the room um, uh, pretty much all the time, uh, where if we were meeting with Asian partners, the assumption was what am I doing on our side of the table? Uh, where um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the diversity of America was not so clear in its foreign policy as it is now. And it's been very exciting to, to participate. I, I will say one thing to this group of leaders, which is that uh, in your own communities, uh, 
the Republic of Korea understands the need for a deep global connection in a way that many parts of the United States do not. Uh, I'll never forget, I was teaching international trade law at Yale Law School during the Uruguay round, and I went to Seoul. And I had a lunch with uh, a university faculty. Uh, and there were 18 members of that university faculty who taught trade. And I taught trade for Yale once every third year. And we went around and I said, I told them what I taught, then I said, what do you teach? And they said, Kim, medical devices. Kim, <laughs> uh, you know, intellectual property, Kim. Uh, <laughs> and we also, at the time, this was the early days of the internet, where we were receiving our signals at, uh, remember, 28.8 <laughs> uh, baud per second, and I pointed this out, and they all laughed, and they said, we, we have 56.6. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that, uh, interestingly, um, it's one thing to talk to um, your communities here in the United States about Korean interests, but it's also important to talk about the interest and need to stay global. I mean, the idea that somehow we're going to have a uh, successful economic recovery without a full engagement with the global economy, which is obviously deeply interconnected, uh, or that um, uh, the, the appropriate response uh, in a time of reception is to become more insular. Uh, I think just you know defies uh, basic economic uh, um, uh, rules. So uh, you successfully uh, didn't answer yeah, my question, so point. maybe you'll run for office point. someday. <laughs> okay, point. with that, I'd love to take some questions. And the only <laughs> question you can't ask is how to get your kid into Yale. <laughs> that you cannot ask. Study hard, study hard. Oh, Let's okay. see. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Sang Hee Jung. I work for the World Bank, also do some pro bono work for Good Friends USA. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is to Mr. Goh um, regarding the Korea-US tra free trade agreement. You may know that there's ha there has been a lot of tension in South Korea regarding this issue. And what I hear a lot from South Korean media is that the core problem is the, the different status as a law that's been perceived in Korea and the, in the US. So in Korea, the laws has to be changed a lot because this free, uh, free trade agreement is regarded as an international law in Korea. As um, while in US, it, it is considered as a domestic uh, agree, I mean, agreement in international, but it, does, it doesn't really affect the U.S. domestic law. So when there's any conflict going on between the two laws, then U.S. doesn't have to really worry about it, just ignore, and then South Korea has to change their law to comply for it. So uh, I believe, and I trust you are the real expert in the law, so as the expert in law, and I also believe that you have balanced interest in both countries. I really want to hear your opinion and the clarification, because it really um, concerns me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Can we keep our questions really short, because we're short on time? Thanks, Harold. So let me answer at two levels. Um, <laughs> the most important level, my, my father liked to say, Koreans are great people, but make sure their aspirations uh, are uh, dominant as opposed to their fears. You know, Koreans worry. One reason Koreans accomplish so much is they worry all the time. Uh, <laughs> but you know, there is a bright future ahead. Every day there's problems, but there's a bright future ahead. And the Korea-U.S. Free, free Trade Agreement is uh, the most important uh, uh, free trade agreement the U.S. has signed in nearly 20 years. On the legal point, which is a pretty straightforward, uh, at the international plane, both the US and Korea are bound uh, as a matter of international law by this agreement. There's a different form as a matter of domestic law. Uh, the United States does not do trade agreements by treaty, which are advised and consented to by two thirds of the Senate. They do them by congressional executive agreement. This has been done since 1933. Uh, pursuant to authority under the Trade, uh, Trade Agreements Act. So um, I, I think that uh, there is no legal concern. The US treats this as a binding international commitment. 
uh, as well as uh, you know a, a enacted piece of U.S. law, which we will respect because the president has a duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. But um, the fact that you ask the question or that people ask you the question shows again that um, you know. Uh, the great thing about Koreans is they're never quite sure that the good thing that happened to them is really that good. <laughs> this is what keeps us always questing for more. Right? And, and, but sometimes I think you need to say, step back, don't let your aspirations overwhelm your fears. Can you get mics to um, whoever's raising a hand, please? Can I? And please keep your questions short so we can get as many questions in as possible. Hi, uh, my name is Kathy Moon. I teach um, political science at Wellesley College. So from one professor to another, it's nice to be here. There are other professors in the audience here. Uh, my questions uh, are for both of you. You can divide your labor whichever way you want. Um, one is, a, a, I guess, a consultational question. Um, there are, as many of us in this room know, we get stuck between Korea and the United States in many ways. Um, many Americans sometimes think we're not American enough. Koreans think we're not Korean enough. At the same time, we serve as um, mediators and bridges. And there, is, um, there are issues out in Korea um, where they could bubble up into legal suits against the United States. And I am, this is a genuine question uh, regarding specific issues right now that I know about, and it's something that I've been uh, struggling with. Um, what are the ways short of lawsuits that Koreans with specific grievances against the United States government for historical reasons or other reasons um, can um, take some action or try to find some way of getting uh, America's ear? So that's one question. Um, another one's regarding North Korean human rights. These are short questions, but they're distinct yeah. questions, okay? North Korean human rights, uh, very recently, profess uh, Professor, my God, far from it, President um, Im myung bak of South Korea um, stated that the human rights issue in North Korea should be, um, if not as important, maybe more important than the nuclear issue. So I'd like to know what the State Department's take, what the White House's take um, might be on that, how you would interpret it and respond. And um, if you have time, if you could consider, um, because these are some things that academics think about, why is it that in the United States the human rights debate um, is significantly dominated by conservatives when we know that liberals and conservatives both care, but the public debate is something that is very much dominated by one group, and how do we even this out? Thank you. Well, when I was Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, I would go to Asia and I would sit across from Asian um, interlocutors who would tell me, Asians don't believe in human rights. And, and I would say, look at my face. <laughs> I don't think so. Now, they didn't ask me whether I was a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that any party has a monopoly on the human rights concern. Uh, obviously, I mean, to, to uh, our relationship with North Korea has many dimensions. And uh, the nuclear issue is a human rights issue as well. So I, I think, in a way, it, it's a um, uh, kind of a shell game as to, to how we're addressing this. And on the question of lawsuits, um, you know, obviously we're, we live in a free country, and in uh, Korea, citizens do as well. And there are ways to air your grievances. But usually, and I'm a law dean uh, and professor, uh, a lawsuit means a breakdown of communication, leaving you the only option of filing suit. Um, and you know we have many ways now, many channels and connections between the U.S. and Korea, people to people, government to government, which allow issues and concerns to be raised through these other mechanisms of dialogue. So I, I don't think that um, I w if I were being asked to advise. Koreans and Korean Americans, I would say, have you exhausted these other angles, which might be, at the end, more productive in terms of achieving the outcomes you wish? Uh, you know, in his, in his speech before uh, Hoffs uh, back in, in March, President Obama uh, called on the leaders of North Korea to choose the, the, the dignity and welfare of the North Korean people over the pursuit of nuclear weapons. And it speaks to kind of the the inherent logic of uh, kind of the holistic view of the North Korea system that, that 
would say a, 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 a country that would pursue nuclear weapons at, at great expense, great isolation to its people uh, and put its people through this also would have the same types of uh, human rights standards that we see there. So there is a, a logical connection between the two issues. Uh, you know, we take human rights in North Korea very seriously. We have a special envoy, Robert King, at the State Department who focuses solely on this issue, who was the first uh, human rights uh, envoy to visit Pyongyang back in May 2011. So we, we also, in, in spite of the fact that the headline grabber is always the six party talks, nuclear tests and missile launches, we have never lost sight of the human rights issue as being important on North Korea. Okay, so in the interest of time, there's a lot of questions. Please keep your, your question to one question. I'm gonna add, take two questions and you can answer either or neither. Um, Jayco is a chief investment officer at OPEC. No, no relation. No, no, no relation. No relation. No relation. <laughs> um, I just want you to take a look forward. I mean, you've seen the kind of arc of history and the participation both in U.S.-Korea relationships and the evol evolution of that and the role, uh, increasing role of participation of Asian Americans and Korean Americans in government in the United States. So if you fast forward 10 years, what does that world look like in terms of both of those issues, U.S.-Korea relations and participation of, US, of Korean Americans in government, and how do we get there? Okay, and then one more question, and then let's try to answer them together if, if possible. Hi, my name is Ji Young Kim from Good Friends USA. I want to ask a question about uh, humanitarian aid to North Korea. Um, I would like to bring our attention to the North Korean, North Korean people who are struggling right now um, due to the, the serious food shortage. And I would like to ask you what's, um, a, a, what's the administration standpoint towards the humanitarian aid aside from political issues? And um, what's your take on um, the opinion that um, if we provide um, the humanitarian aid, um, like take initiative um, to take uh, to provide humanitarian aid first to break this cycle and stalemate situation, stop to um, contribute to like not making this nuclear situation worse at least. Okay, thank you. Well, go ahead on the. Okay, okay well. <laughs> You know, the United States has no disagreements with the North Korean people, um, nor does the U.S. The U.S. wants um, the government to satisfy the needs of its own people. And, um, you know, at the first level, humanitarian assistance is a critical element of this, and we provide this to many, many countries in the world. But obviously, uh, nutritional assistance is one of the most basic things that a government can ensure to its people. And if it's not providing that, the broader set of political questions have to be addressed at a government-to-government -government level. Uh, with regard to Jay's question, um, the, uh, I think Korean-American participation in American political life will obviously grow. I'm, I'm looking at Mark uh, Keem here. Um, I remember when I ran for um, uh, uh, president of my uh, seventh grade class and was defeated. <laughs> uh, my father said to me, in this country, Harold, our future is in appointive politics. <laughs> <laughs> Say it ain't so. Uh, yes, which is, Sam Yoon, uh, another <laughs> former elected official. Which, which is what led me to my current path. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that um, I think this has changed and that um, uh, 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 Korean Americans and Asian Americans writ large uh, not only have a constituency, uh, but also speak for certain values which are you know, much broader, uh, clearly. Just, just take two, you know, education. Uh, no one could care more about education than uh, Asian Americans or Korean Americans. The truth of it is that many Korean Americans provide home education to the point where the education that students are receiving through the public system is, is uh, much less important. But I, I do think that the, the focus on education, uh, then the other is the treatment of the elderly. Um, this is obviously a central concern to every single one of us, our own parents and uh, others uh, of a senior generation. In, in many of our cases, the people who made it possible for us to live in this country. So I think to speak to these uh, particular issues which are of interest to all Americans, uh, but from a Korean-American perspective, is extremely powerful. No, and I would just interestingly add to that as, as kind of like an outside observer, having spent the last 30 years 
uh, in language and area studies related jobs in the intelligence community in the Department of Defense and State Department, the, the growth that Harold mentioned earlier in the last decade in the number of, of Korean Americans entering the civil service and starting to make an impact has been phenomenal. I still remember when uh, the first Korean American naturalized was able to get a security clearance in the early 1980s. And that was a, a market, uh, it was a pivotal point in the, uh, in, the, in the employment and the wise use of Korean Americans, Asian Americans off across the board for their cultural language, uh, as well as, of course, their own specialized expertise, political science economists, uh, international relations specialists. So the impact, Sung Kim is uh, kind of like the first wave of what we will see a large number of young 20 and 30 year old just outstanding professionals at State Department, at CIA, at Defense Department. So it's very promising. Great, one question there, one question there quickly, please. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Nancy Kwong Johnson and um, uh, I'm a, an Associate Professor of International Relations. Um, let's see, as the uh, daughter of a Korean mother born in uh, Pyongyang, the last time I was in North Korea was in October of 2008 with a group called Network for Korean American Leaders under the direction of Dr. Jian Lee. Mm -hmm. um, my question is with respect to uh, uh, how the Obama administration envisions using Joseph Nye's hard, soft, or smart power as well as e-diplomacy vis-a-vis North Korea. Thank you. And then one more question there. I'm Dong Geun Lee. I'm working for the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North, in North, uh, North, in North Korea. Uh, I'm a huge fan, a huge fan of the head of the Office of Air. Uh, you, you work now. Uh, and the most fundamental human right is the right to life. And I wonder how the U.S. U.S. government you are serving, serving, uh, you are serving, serving now, link the food aid to the nuclear we weapon problem of the North, North, uh, North, North Korea, uh, if, uh, if, although there are many ways to prevent the food aid uh, from being, di uh, uh, from being divert, divert, diverted. Thank you. So maybe I can uh, fold these questions together. Um, it, to the extent to which um, uh, hard power uh, meant uh, you know, cooperation on the military side, uh, I think what we've been discussing here is uh, a much, much thicker and deeper network uh, in which uh, the two countries look to them to each other as uh, sources of common values. Uh, and that soft power, Joe Nye's concept, is uh, just the recognition that when you have multiple channels of influence and communication, you don't need to use crude methods of communication, namely threats. Uh, as a way of communicating. Now there's a special problem, which is uh, the, the, um, the fact that virtually, virtually uh, uh, none of the people of North Korea have access to the internet. I, I was struck um, uh, Kim Jong-il when I was there in December 2000 had told us with pride that he had three computers and spent a huge amount of time communicating with, you know, watching the internet. Uh, but if you go back to your room and turn on the television, they're running replays of 1950 movies about uh, Kim Il-sung, mm -hmm. um, which I think people had just stopped watching because they were so obviously irrelevant to what's going on. So I do think that ways to seek more people-to-people -people penetration is critical. Uh, I think the more that uh, people in North Korea know what's actually going on in the outside world and vice versa, the better off we are. No, I, I agree and I think everybody's well aware of, of the stories of the DVDs and thumb drives smuggling in uh, South Korean dramas and other information from the outside so that, I mean, there is been, it, it's, not a, a, it's not a readily apparent shift. There is not an internet uh, you know, desktop computer on every college student's desk like there is in, in the Republic of Korea. But information penetration is spreading in the North. And, and you know, we, we dedicate ourselves $3 million in grant money to NGOs for, for the purpose of increasing information access and the amount of information that flows in, into North Korea. And you know, our, our administration has, has not opposed 
uh, people to people exchanges. And we were very, uh, you know, forward leaning in our putting on the table uh, packages to include the nutritional assistance that, is, that, that reflects President Obama's own articulated concern for the welfare of the North Korean people. And uh, as we pursue denuclearization, I mean, it, it, it is not a zero-sum trade-off between doing things to improve information access, to send messages to the North Korean people that we care about them, to address the needs of the North Korean people to the degree to which the regime fails to meet their needs and the regime acts to prevent us from meet, meeting those needs. It's not a, it's not a zero-sum trade-off with us. Thank you so much for your time and for your insightful comments and your humor. Um, we look forward to uh, the day when we have a Korean-American president and a Korean-American Supreme Court justice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we were there together on that trip. Yeah, I love those delegations. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, just, I think all of us can agree that this was just an outstanding program, and it's great to see um, friends from far and wide come to the White House today. I'd like us to all just thank the White House Office of Public Engagement for making today possible. Um, I realize I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Tina Yoon, and I've been um, working with the Council of Korean Americans as the executive director for about the past year. This is our first public event in which we, um, so for the last year we've been working on setting things up with the organization, but we're really excited about today. And um, just to share a quick story with you, we were on a planning call trying to look through the uh, people who had registered and was oversubscribed, and we're getting pretty stressed. And um, Esther Lee, you know, who you just saw here, she just said, well, of course it's oversubscribed because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And everybody laughed, yeah, yeah, we agree. But then I actually said, well, this better not be the only time in my life that we have an event like this at the White House. And I truly mean that. Um, I think she, you know, her statement underscored the fact that today really is special. And I agree with her wholeheartedly on that. But I see today as just being the beginning of a lot, lo long lifetime relationship that continues past this generation. And, um, and we want to be, remain in communication and dialogue with the White House and the administration, regardless of who the president is. So we started here you know, today with the Obama administration, but we'll see what happens in November. And we just want to be able to continue this through the years. Um, and SICA wants to help facilitate this dialogue. But of course, we can't do this alone. It requires us all to be in partnership together. And so it's really important that all of you took time out of your busy schedules to come here today. And so we're really grateful. And um, I think this um, also brings me to my last point, which is that we're going to go to the Indian Treaty Room and have a beautiful lunch. And it's going to be Korean food. Um, I hope you're all excited about that. There's no kimchi, because we didn't want to like scare the office workers here <laughs> with the smell. So, But I think you'll find some of your favorites there. Um, but what I really wanted to do was encourage all of you to take advantage of this special opportunity we have. Not only, you know, we already had this part with the White House, but that you are here gathered together from around the country. You have this special opportunity to get to know one another. You are all leaders within your communities. And you may not have had a chance to meet one another before. So really make the most of, this, uh, of the next hour and a half that we have together. And um, the Office of Public Engagement has asked everybody to fill out this survey. So not only are we to try to get to know one another, but also we'd like to keep the dialogue open with the Office of Public Engagement. They are the key to our link to the federal government here. And so there will be interns that will go around and collect your completed survey. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And um, the, the way to get to the Indian Treaty Room is through this door over here on your left. Don't go back through there, go this way. Oh, we're not ready yet? Okay. Okay, why don't we start the networking here? It, it's actually good because now you have time to fill out the survey. So about how much time do you think? Okay, so about 10 minutes. And then, okay. So thank you everyone for coming. Okay.